We will be in the book of Jonah today, not the book of Acts. But open your Bibles as we begin to the book of Psalms, Psalm 103. <clears throat> and as you turn there, by way of introduction, especially for our younger attendees today, children, I want you to think of the Comrades Marathon. I normally do not see my sermons after what's going on in the city, but it is a very good illustration. My children asked me, will the Comrades be an illustration in your sermon? I'm like, Actually, yes. <laughs> Think of being a runner who loves running. And then a race is given to you from Peter Maritzburg to Durban, the Comrades Marathon. But as you line up to the starting line and the gunshot goes off and you start the running, you turn around and head the other direction. You love running. You're a runner. You love the Comrades Marathon. And yet, you decide to turn around and head the other direction, going out of town the other way. <laughs> and then, we find out the reason you did it is because there were people in need in Durban. You were not running the comrades, you were running to help them meet their need. And you disliked them so much, you ran the other way. <laughs> That's a pretty fitting illustration of Jonah, isn't it? <laughs> a prophet of the Lord! who prophesied for the Lord in the land of Israel over a number of years to the kings of the time. Faithful prophet of the Lord, a runner who likes to run. And yet, when the Lord told him about the people in need very far away, whom he needs to prophesy to, reveal the word of the Lord to them, he turned and went the other way because he didn't like those people. It would be dumb to like running to Durban and knowing there's people in need that you're running to and you can help them to head the other direction. And that's exactly what Jonah did because he had no compassion. Today, from the book of Jonah, we're going to learn about the God of all compassion. But it's not just a one-sided sermon. It's two-sided. It is the God of all compassion and the people without compassion. And it's going to be an accurate reflection of our own hearts and obviously of the true God. So let's pray, then we'll start in Psalm 103 and make our way to the book of Jonah. But let's pray first. Our Heavenly Father, we pray today that you would give us a grand, high view of you, not in some mystical, sensational, sweeping up kind of emptiness, but with substance. Teach us something about you from your own word today. And Lord, as we hold the mirror of ourselves up to your perfections, may we see how much we fail in imitating your great compassion. Teach us through your word for Jesus' sake. Amen. Psalm 103, verse 8 quotes a passage from Scripture from Exodus already, perhaps the most repeated verse on God Himself. Oh, there's lots of repeated truths about God in Scripture, but this is perhaps the most repeated direct statement about God and who He is. If there's one thing about God that you know, it should be this little paragraph. It comes from the time of Moses on Mount Sinai, Quoted here by David, Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. What does that mean to us? The psalmist continues, He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His steadfast love towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does He remove our transgressions from us. 
As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. God gives better than he needs to. God gives better than he needs to. And one of the words that describe that character trait of God is the word compassion, isn't it? Compassion. He doesn't reject us because of our sin. He doesn't respond in kind to our sin. But he removes from us the guilt and filth of our own sin. He dwells on our weakness with compassion. And it's not just a compassion that is pity. It is a compassion that acts to make our situation, our pitiful situation, better. That's where compassion and pity differ, right? Pity you feel for everyone running to Durban today. <laughs> but compassion is coming to somebody to whom you feel pity and seeing if you can't do something about their sad situation. If you want a definition for God's compassion, you could say it's His warm, merciful love. Love acts. Merciful gives better than is deserved, better than is needed. His compassion is the combination then of His mercy and His love. Practically, it simply means God gives better than is necessary. And already you feel convicted about your compassion towards one another, right? We give as is necessary, not better than is necessary. God's compassion means that he has a warm spot in his heart for people who deserve the opposite of a warm spot in his heart. Destruction is what they deserve because of their wickedness against him. God's compassion means God only punishes sinners after showing them abundant grace. God's compassion means he gives better than he needs to. Compassion then is not just a feeling of pity, but it's an action to make the pitiful situation better. And perhaps the best passage in Scripture to explain God's compassion, not just teach it like this famous quote in verse 8 of Psalm 103, perhaps the best place to illustrate God's compassion is the book of Jonah. So go find the book of Jonah if you haven't already stuck a paper next to it. <clears throat> book of Jonah in the Old Testament. Perhaps stuck between all the little books there. There we go. Obadiah, that's a harder one to find. And then Jonah, and then Micah. Micah is a bit longer. It's perhaps your page will land there. So just before Micah, just after Obadiah. Yes, my boy. Our Micah. No, not our Micah. <laughs> The prophet Micah. <laughs> this is my second interruption while preaching <laughs> ever. <laughs> Turn to the prophet Jonah, who is right before the prophet Micah. <laughs> if I would say to you, Jonah and, why would you complete the sentence? Jonah and the fish. You might as well answer now. <laughs> Jonah and the whale, Jonah and the giant fish, Jonah and the fish. The fish, though, is just a servant of the Lord in this book. It is Jonah and the Lord. Or perhaps more precise, it's not even about the person so much as it is Jonah's compassion and the Lord's compassion. <clears throat> the fish is just a little detail in the middle somewhere. Jonah is a story about an uncompassionate prophet and his very compassionate God. And we'll learn two lessons repeatedly as we go throughout this book, this little prophet book. The first lesson is on how compassionate God is, and how incredibly compassionate He is, not just to the Ninevites, but to everyone in the story. And then the second lesson will 
learn repeatedly is how little compassion we tend to show. How much compassion God shows and how little compassion we tend to show. And you need the show word. You need the action with it. So we literally have five scenes of contrast of compassion. <clears throat> Four, roughly one per chapter, and then a famous uh, bringing it together at the end. <clears throat> five scenes of a contrast of compassion. Let's begin in verse 1 with scene 1 of this account. It's narrative for the most part, and therefore five scenes. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare, and he went on board to go with him to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. It starts here with a call to preach judgment on Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrians. Jonah, however, knows that if the evil of a nation has come before God for reckoning, God is going to give them an opportunity to repent first. And so he flees the other way, literally the opposite direction. He has zero compassion for the Ninevites. They're the capi- that's the capital of Assyria, the notorious, evil, pagan, cruel, hated nation. Now, at first, you might say you should be keen to cry out against them because of their sin. But let's skip forward just quickly to understand why he ran the other way. Let's skip forward just quickly. I know it's not the way you're supposed to read the Scriptures, but you need to understand this from the beginning. Chapter 4, verse 2. This is many, many um, days, months even later. Jonah was praying to the Lord, and he said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? So this was going on in his head in chapter 1. This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. So this explains why he's going the wrong way. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We've seen that before in Psalm 103, didn't we? He knew that from David's psalm. He knew that even more so from Moses writing in Exodus. He says, I went the other way, Lord, because I knew that you are slow to anger and gracious and compassionate. Jonah was given a commandment involving displaying God's compassion, warning of judgment and offer of compassion. He was given a commandment to show it to people as a prophet of the Lord. He's done so many times before in the land of Israel, but when it came to the land of Assyria, he would directly disobey. Now, what does Jonah deserve for this? Well, death, right? The wages of sin is death, even if you are a faithful prophet of the Lord. But God is compassionate. He gives better than is deserved. So what does Jonah get from God? Well, he gets a second chance. Verse 4, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was on the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down, there's a lot of going down in this chapter, he had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, Why do you, what do you mean, you sleeper? He doesn't even have a name, it's just sleeper. Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they say to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Talk about God being sovereign over all the events up to now. Then they say to him, Tell us on what account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? You might not know what it feels like to be asked, What's your occupation if you're a prophet? But it's like a pastor being asked, what do you do for a living just after you were rude to someone? 
Okay, it's, he, he's a prophet. He tells people the truth, and he's going to tell them, I'm a prophet. I'm running away from my God. Verse 9, he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord Yahweh, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Here's evangelism starts. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What should we do to you that the sea may, be qui may quiet down for us? For the sea grew, sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up, hurl me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. God is compassionate. <laughs> still, though, being alive still, on the ship, not sinking, still, though, Jonah would rather die than show that same compassion to the Ninevites. Even the sailors are more compassionate than he is because they set Jonah's self-suicide kind of advice aside first for his own sake. Verse 12 continues, or he said, pick me up, hurl me into the sea. Verse 13, nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to Yahweh. O oh Lord Yahweh, let us not perish for this man's life. Lay not on us innocent blood, for you, Yahweh, have done as it pleased you. By the way, I'm going to say Yahweh for the rest of this book instead of capital L-O-R-D, because you need to understand it's the right God they're addressing, not just a deity. So they picked Jonah up, hurled him into the sea eventually, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared Yahweh exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and made vows. And Yahweh appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Did you notice in all the, the excitement of the story the acts of compassion from the Lord? First, the sea goes calm, instantly calm, compassion on the sailors. The sailors, as far as we can tell, get saved. Seems like everybody in this book gets saved, except Jonah's supposed to be telling them about salvation. Well, he's saved already, but he's, he's missing the point. They get it all. They worship the true God. And then another act of compassion, verse 17, Yahweh goes and appoints a fish as a rescue, rescue mission for Jonah to keep him from drowning. He was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. It doesn't say he died when the fish swallowed him. You see, already we're just getting started on the story. That we're just, we kind of picked up momentum quickly, but we're still picking up momentum to the point of the story. And already we have a great contrast of compassion, don't we? The uncompassionate Jonah, who will disobey God's direct order rather than be compassionate, who will want to die before he shows compassion to sinners. You have him on the one side, and then you have the compassionate God on the other side. Giving him a second chance, getting a bunch of pagans to inquire about his faith to get to the heart issue. He got to the heart issue, but he didn't repent, did he? And then you have the compassion of the sailors who, who rode harder instead of throwing him overboard immediately. And you have God's compassion in the form of a calm sea and calmed hearts. As the men fear the Lord exceedingly, Old Testament terminology for faith. One chapter in, first scene done, and already the contrast is clear. What Jonah lacked God was abundant in, not just in feelings, in actions. Well, that brings us to scene two, the fish part of the story. 1 verse 17, the Lord Yahweh appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to Yahweh as God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to Yahweh out of my distress, and he answered me. 
Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. That's like saying from the middle of the realm of the dead, okay? I'm, I'm about to die, and God heard me there. For you cast me in the deep, into the heart of the sea. The flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I'm driven away from your sights. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The water closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountains I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pits, O Lord my God, O Yahweh, God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, but I, with a voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And Yahweh spoke to the fish and vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. It's compassion from beginning to end. That's the point of Jonah's speech or prayer year. He's saying, no matter how deep I went, no matter how desperate it got, no matter how much I was actually trying to get my way, get away from the presence of the Lord, from there you picked me right up again. You did not leave or forsake me. Perhaps the most repeated promise in the Old Testament. I will never leave and never forsake you. When I cried, you heard, God, God does not need to listen when we cry after repeated disobedience, does He? But He does. Compassion. When I was in the deepest of danger, He's talking about the roots of the mountains way down there. He says, I went down to the land, but He's in the sea, so it's the bottom of the sea. When I was in the deepest danger, even there, God found me and just pulled me up again. Compassion. Better than deserved. He's not falling down into the depths because of the trials of life. He's jumping into the depths. It's the way he is trying to go. And he says, it's your waves, it's your bellows, it's everything from you crashing down on me, and yet from there you bring me up again. And it ends by saying, I will sacrifice to you, I will pay my vow, salvation belongs to the Lord. Where did you hear that? In Jonah. Well, the sailors, right? They were doing exactly the same thing, sacrificing, making vows. Salvation is from the Lord, be it physical deliverance or be it spiritual salvation. And in verse 10, even more compassion, instead of digesting Jonah and the story ending, God shows Jonah compassion by giving him yet another chance at making this right. Now, based on verse 9, uh, verse 8 and verse 9, we should conclude that Jonah repented here. But did he become compassionate? He repented, the fish is going to vomit him out, he's going to end up on dry land, he's going to go to Nineveh, he's going to obey. He learned the lesson of obedience. There was repentance for the sin of disobedience, but did Jonah learn the lesson of compassion? Now just follow that away for a moment because we're first going to go to scene three before we get back to answer that question. Scene two, Jonah greatly needed compassion. He himself was not yet compassionate, but God again acted in compassion. And then we get to chapter 3, another scene. He's back on dry land again, dramatic change. God gives him another lesson in compassion. If 1 verse 2 didn't work, there's a great city, they've sinned, please go preach to them. If that didn't work, God will repeat the lesson, but this time He will give that lesson with the faces of the unsaved right in front of Him. Because it's one thing for me to stand up in the pulpit and say, there's some people in need, let's, let's go help them. It's quite another when I take you to them and say, can we help them now? When you see the need in their faces, when you see the individual's when you learn their names. Chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city. Call out against it the message that I tell you. 
So Jonah rose and went to Nineveh according to the word of Yahweh. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city, three days journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Go preach. He goes. He sees them all. He walks through the whole city. Faces before him. This is almost, you could say, forced compassion. (laughs) Okay, I want you to stand right in front of them, walk through the entire city, meet most of them, and preach. It was a great act of compassion to preach to them. But sadly, there was still no heart of compassion. The people believe God, though. They receive God's compassion. The people, even the king repents. Verse 6, the word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published throughout Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God." Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. They were notorious for their cruelty. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned, how they repented from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that He had said He would do to them, and He did not do it. It's one of these great passages where man repents and changes from his evil way, and God changes or repents in a different sense, so the word relent is better. But God, though He doesn't change internally, His character is the same. He changes in the way He's going to deal with you because His character requires that. I will judge the wicked, I'll be merciful to the repentance. And so his response to them changes. Oh, they did not deserve to hear the warning of God's judgments. They did not deserve to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they did. All in God's plan because God loves to give better than is deserved. That's why they're the gospel message. That's our third scene of compassion again. Obedience from Jonah. Not a lot of compassion yet, and we'll see there's literally none at this stage. And yet again, a set of profound acts of compassion from God. Let's them hear, the entire city hears. Jonah, a prophet, normally needs to address his prophecies to the king. They're the king's advisors. That was his job. They appointed kings of all kinds of nations. They ministered to the kings. He didn't. The word just somehow reached the king. And the whole city repents. God loves to give better than people deserve. Now Jonah will eventually obey in a full sense, demonstrating God's compassion fully. But it is actually a heartless obedience that we see here in chapter 3. And chapter 4 makes that clear for us. A heartless, a compassionless obedience. Sounds wonderful, he obeyed, but now we get to see what's actually going on in Jonah's heart this whole time. Chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. That phrase should almost make you think back to Cain in Genesis chapter 4. He was displeased by how God dealt with Abel accepting a sacrifice by faith, and he got angry. Jonah was displeased. Why so angry? Is it because he didn't understand compassion? Well, not really. We read this verse in the beginning, verse 2. 
He prayed to Yahweh and said, Oh, Yahweh is not this what I said when I was yet in my country. This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, other way. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. A God who does not want the wicked to perish. Oh, they'll perish if they persist. But He's a God who does not want them to perish. He'll relent if they repent. You need to understand this. If there's one thing you get from the sermon or need to say on Wednesday at our home group to show that you were listening, if there's one thing you get here, it is Jonah did not get angry because he misunderstood compassion. Jonah got angry because he did understand compassion. He did know God's compassion. After all, he himself had experienced it his whole life. He too was a sinner who was saved, chosen to be a, a messenger of God's Word. He wanted to receive compassion, but he would not give it to his enemies. He knew that God was compassionate, and that's why he didn't want to go to Nineveh. Jonah's problem was not ignorance. Jonah's problem was that he himself had no real compassion. Oh, he'd show compassion and love and kindness to his fellow Israelites, but he would not show it to one of the most famous enemies of Israel. Verse 2, we read that. Verse 3 continues. Therefore now, Yahweh, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. He's back on a boat all over again. <laughs> the sailors must have, might have thrown him out, the fish might have vomited him out, but in his heart he's still sleeping on that boat. I'd rather die than see the Ninevites saved. He wanted to receive it, but he would, did not want to give it. And like God has been doing ever since Cain, God responds to the sinful rebellion of Jonah with a counseling question. Talk about another act of compassion. With a counseling question that helpfully points the sinner towards the heart issue. Okay, we've done this with one another, right? When we're struggling with a sin, you don't really see it. There are these pointed questions to get you there, to help you realize from the Scriptures what's going on in your heart. God does that. Verse 4, Yahweh said to him, Do you do well to get angry? <laughs> Again, like Cain, if you do well, you'll be accepted. God told Cain. Is it right for you to get angry? Are you looking and saying, I want to respond righteously, and in this case, anger is the righteous response? Well, it must have fallen on deaf ears, this rather pointed question, because the story continues with no response from Jonah. Verse 5, no response. We just read what he did. Jonah went out of the city, sat to the east of the city, made a booth for himself there. He sat under in the shade till he should see what would become of that city. That's not pastoral. The pastor doesn't preach a message of condemnation and repentance and then leave. No, you go and sit with them. You sit under their booth. You eat with them till you've answered all their questions. You go make disciples. You teach them all that I have commanded you, as Jesus said. Well, Jonah, he goes out. He had obeyed. He had given the minimum compassion version of the gospel that was necessary. And I was hoping to see the nation destroyed and be an eyewitness of what would be the greatest front page news in Israel. Jonah had obeyed, but his attitude of anger showed that the obedience was completely insincere. How does God respond to such rebellious, insincere obedience? It's the right thing in some ways. Well, this is a message of many of the prophets, especially the minor prophets. They were sacrificing at the temple. They were doing everything right all the time. And yet God said, I'd rather desire that you just show compassion to the needy. External obedience does not please God if the heart is not right. But how does God then respond to such rebellious, insincere disobedience? Well, Jonah knows. Nineveh. 
They've been evil and insincere. God destroys you. But look what God does. Verse 6. Now Yahweh God appointed a plant. He appointed a fish earlier. Now he appoints a plant. And made it come up over Jonah. You can just see the plant growing. And then God's like, turn right now. And it goes over Jonah. That it might be a shade over his head. It's not to strangle him. It's to give him shade. To save him from his discomfort. We're talking about sin. Being, people being saved from sin. And here God is caring about it. He doesn't feel nice. The sun's hot. Discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. He's a rather extreme character. Exceedingly angry. Exceedingly glad. God commands a plant to grow over Jonah sitting outside sinning. The plant obeys God much better than Jonah did. And again, it's another act of compassion. It's a lesson of compassion. And then, because God is still working to teach Jonah the main lesson of compassion too, and Jonah doesn't get it by receiving compassion, he doesn't learn the lesson by receiving compassion, God undoes the plant. He sends a worm to eat the plant, then he sends a, a wind to dry out the plant, and then he sends the sun to burn on the bald spot on Jonah's head. Verse 7. When dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. Remember, he sat on the east side of the city. Now east wind comes. He gets the wind, the punishment from God, not the city. The sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint, and he asked that he might die. He's still on that request. And he said, it's better for me to die than to live and see God's compassion on display. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? Now, that's the same question he asked earlier. So God graciously and compassionately extends the counseling session for Jonah's sake this time. Do you do well to be angry for the plant? He said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow. It came into being in a night, it perished in a night. Should not I pity Nineveh? That great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left. That's little innocent children. There's also much cattle. The end. <laughs> it is an odd end. And we'll get to it in a moment. But what's the point here from verses 7 to 9 when God interacts again with Jonah? I believe Jonah wrote the book the way he did and ended it the way he did to teach us the lesson that he only learned in the last two verses. It's a lesson of, of compassion. God always gives better than is necessary which means God's a very compassionate God. And Jonah, a man who, like all of us, to be honest, receives a lot of compassion from God, is typically very, very slow to demonstrate it in even the smallest of ways to others. And so scene number three, or four, sorry, ends with again this contrast between Jonah and his anger over the Ninevites coming to salvation and God being so compassionate as to even take care of his discomforts. And still, Jonah is fuming within. Which brings us then to the dramatic book ending. Verse 10 and 11. Yahweh said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I, the Lord, pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from the left, 
and also much cattle. The word ends on cattle. See, the book of Jonah is a book with only one point. God is full of compassion for people, even for animals. Unlike us. I told you there's, told you there's a two-part lesson. It is not just about God's compassion. It is about God's compassion unlike us. Mankind generally has no clue what true compassion looks like. Oh, we've got lots of philanthropists and, and very caring people who are incredibly exemplary in their compassion, and yet as a whole, mankind still has no clue what it really means to give better than is deserved. To do something kind to somebody who has nothing is, is kindness. But compassion and mercy and love, that is doing the same kind act to the person who deserves the exact opposite from you. We do not really know what it means to show true compassion. We care almost exclusively for things like personal comfort and convenience and earthly things. Oh, we love to receive compassion. But sometimes the receiving of it just makes us want it all the more and make us all the more resistant to give it. Jonah suffered of, with self-pity. <laughs> you know self-pity. It loves pity. Oh, it loves pity. It'll take all it can get. But it won't show an ounce to someone else. But God is very, very different to us, isn't He? God is very, very different to us. God is a God of true compassion, and He will show it in the most simple of ways and the most profound of ways. He'll do salvation for sinners, and He'll make a plant grow up for shade. He'll care about 120,000 innocent people in a city full of violence, and He'll care about their cows. God used His incredible power as King of kings and Lord of lords to bring a preacher to the Ninevites. We use our little power that we have to complain about not enough shade. Do you, do you sense the comparison? I can go endlessly comparing everything. Comparison is the point here. Verse 10, you pity Verse 11, should not I pity? It's a contrast of compassion, contrast of the actions that flow from true pity. 4 verse 10 is human compassion. It's selfish. It's about my comforts. I put no effort in, but I want all the benefits. That's human compassion. Human compassion is short-sighted. It doesn't care about eternal things. It cares about what happens this night. <laughs> Small, temporary things. Divine compassion, on the other hand, is selfless. It is God acting for the benefit of the other, not subtly for the benefit of Himself in some twisted way. It's people and their stuff even, their things. Divine compassion is also spiritual. It's not temporal. It's not just concerned about the things of life and the trials of life. It's concerned about eternal, spiritual things. As Jonah said so well at the end of his prayer in chapter 2, salvation belongs to the Lord. Deliverance in an earthly sense and eternal salvation from your sins. It's spiritual. Jonah's was the plant, something physical and temporary. God's pity was the persons. In fact, it says persons here, not just people. It's persons is a good translation. It's the sons of Adam, those made in the image of God. That's where God directs His compassion. Oh, I see this on our chatter groups on WhatsApp and things like that in our community. Somebody gets hit by a car, and there's a few messages of condolences and compassion. A dog gets hit by the car, and the phone buzzes till the next morning with messages. You see how fickle our compassion is. 
Joel James summed up these words ending the book of Jonah. In his book on the attributes of God, he says, Jonah was incensed by the withering of a shady bush. God's heart bled over the 120,000 sinners in Nineveh. It's a striking contrast, isn't it? A two-sided lesson on compassion. We are not very compassionate. God is a God of true compassion. Isaiah 55, verse 7, 8, and 9, some similar themes from Jonah's prayer and comments. Isaiah 55, verse 7, 8, and 9, Let the wicked forsake his way. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that the Lord may have compassion on him. And to our God let him return, for this God will abundantly pardon Then God says this, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. It's not talking about planning for tomorrow. It's talking about this, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts, and that's why I remove your sins from you. God is not like us, and oh, how thankful we are for that, aren't we? He is a God of compassion. A God of compassion who doesn't act the way we act. If He acts, He forgives sinners their sin. When we act, we for the most part just seek our own well-being. He is a God of compassion and we should change to become more like Him. We should not get angry because He is so wonderful. The theme verse of Jonah is 4 verse 2. Okay, the ending is where all the the force is. But the theme is 4 verse 2. I know that you are a gracious and merciful God. I know that you are slow to get angry and you abound. Okay, it's like Tigger and Winnie the Pooh. I'll jump out and be excessive in steadfast love and chesed, loyal, faithful, promised goodness, way beyond what you deserve. God gives better than He needs to, to Jonah and to the Ninevites, but also to all of us, right? In Joel's book on God's compassion, he has a whole table of I deserve, but God gives. I deserve, but God gives. And I'm going to read some of them for you. I deserve eternal death, Revelation 20, but God gives eternal life. I deserve outer darkness, but God gives the eternal day of God's glory. I deserve the gnashing of teeth, but God gives eternal songs of praise. I deserve the lake of fire, but God gives the rivers of the water of life. I deserve eternal destruction, but God gives pleasures forevermore. I deserve depart from me, I never knew you, but God gives well done, good and faithful servants, accepting family love. I deserve the pits of darkness, but God gives streets of gold. I deserve unendurable loneliness, but God gives glorious divine presence. I deserve mourning and crying and pain, but God gives fullness of joy. And there's a set of verses behind each of those. I deserve eternal wrath, but God gives the initiating, incomprehensible, unbreakable love. Just like God gave Jonah better than he deserved, just like God gave the Ninevites better than they deserved, so you do not deserve the new birth. And still God gives it. God continually gives you and me much better than we deserve. So shall we humbly learn from God's compassion and show similar compassion and at least worship God for His compassion? Or are we like Jonah, going to rebelliously complain about not receiving even more. There are many ways you can apply this from the profound spiritual realities that we saw in the book of Jonah, the salvation of pagan sailors, pagan Assyrians, 
down to the basic things, taking care of your cow. Husbands, wives, parents, children, employers, employees, neighbors, you can go make the application, can't you? Jonah wrote a book to teach us the lesson he learned. And he wrote it in such a way that you would reach the same point of shock and incredulity that he had at the end. What will you do with this contrast of compassion? Let's pray. Oh, our Heavenly Father, we must bow our heads and exalt You for such incredible grace and compassion. Oh Lord, as the prophet said so often, we echo it for sure, there is none like You. You will look at us like those Assyrians and forgive us our great evil. Lord, teach us this compassion. Teach us to worship you and then teach us to show the same compassion even on a discomfort level here on this earth. Oh Lord, Genesis 3 and the curse of sin has affected our lives in so many ways. We have a sin problem to deal with and you show compassion for that and salvation. But Lord, there's lots of suffering in life. There's lots of discomforts in this life. It will all go away in heaven, but while it's here, Lord, teach us to be compassionate in the eternal things, and yes, even in the temporal things. For Jesus' sake, amen.